Good day and one love. It's your boy, Seth Garu Baxter from Maker's Bar, creating one million leaders today for tomorrow. Now, I've said in the past to our audience how extremely pleased and honored I am to have our guests, but this is a special treat for music lovers all around, festival lovers all around, old hip hop heads to young hip hop heads, urban culture music aficionados, and a couple of my personal favorites that we'll get into later to mention with our distinguished guests here. Before I introduce his name, I just want to say some of the words that have been spoken about him in testimonials and industry feedback. Take off my glasses here. Kier is a power broker, Chuck D from Public Enemy. Kier is the illest promotional N-word ever said by Buster Rhymes. <laughs> I cannot imagine urban youth culture experiencing the growth that it did in the Southwest without the dedicated efforts of Kier he has always been a hard worker, trustworthy, pun intended, and good natured. Bill Stephanie, the former director, vice president, and president of Def Jam Recordings. That's just a few of those. And to continue, Kier is music media professional pro that always brings positivity and good ideas. He is everywhere, the action in the industry, and is relentless. His accomplishments far precede him. He has worked not only in bringing urban music to the South by Southwest Festival, for those of you who are, uh, who are South by Southwest fans, but he has also brought in a number of our favorite artists, worked with them on several different levels that we're going to get into some of those ex uh, some of those explosive interactions. He has been one of the forefront for those of us who have loved Public Enemy, Buster Rhymes, one of my personal favorites, Anita Baker, Beastie Boys, not only that, but some of his uh, other work has included artists that we all know and love. May I please, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with us Kier Worthy. Kier, thank you, brother, so much. As I'm hey, so uh, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the intro, man. Put you on payroll. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely <clears throat> an honor, Kier. I I look at some of the some of your bio here and some of your experience, and as a music lover myself. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't tell you what an extreme pleasure and honor it is because you are one of the innovators that has been a connector to music that we know today from some of the classic greats mm -hmm. and who we consider icons in the music industry. And for right. us make for us at Makers Bar, it is an extreme pleasure to have you here today. If I can just do a little more about your bio, if you don't mind, before we get jump right in. Sure, go ahead. Sounds good. Kier Worthy, he is the executive di director of the Organization of Black Designers, OBD, the Chief Creative Officer of the boutique branding firm, Rhythm Alchemy Creative Consultants. It's been in, in existence since 1992. It represents black designers globally of every discipline from fashion and interior to automotive and web design. It's the only minority design organization that produces international multidiscipline design conference, design conference, pardon me, designation. It boasts a number of its credentials with General Motors, Senior VP of Global Design, Ed Wilburn, Steve Boy, uh, BET CEO Deborah Lee, Drumline Director Charles Stone, along with Walt, Tis Walt Disney, Blue Chip Companies. There are so many other. Kier is also a former music executive from Def Jam Records, as I mentioned, and Lecture Records, and Warner Brothers. Kier has an extensive resume of people that he's worked with, and I'm so super excited to jump right into some of his experience, starting off with Kier, please share with us a little bit about your origins. How did you begin and where do you come from? Uh, originally born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Um, kind of got started musically there. Uh, DJ'd, I did my first ever promotion <clears throat> with a band in Detroit called Seabank. They had a song, a local song called Wired for Games, and a family friend of ours, Stephen Hill, was working with the group, and I did a, a promotion for them. We put together a, a um, an event at a skate rink in Detroit. You know, roller skating was really big at the time. It still is, actually, here. Oh, yeah. So I did a, uh, a game party where, you know, video games were just coming out, so we did a video game contest at the skating rink, and that was the first music promotion I ever did. 
me, but prior to that, I was kind of off into that because I uh, I skateboarded and I had a skateboard chain. Oh yeah, which of course right here too. Skateboarder, which was super unusual for the time for the era because Detroit was super urban, nowhere near California, not even same kind of weather. And uh, I had a team, and I got a sponsor by about four companies, all California based companies. And it kind of just came from, you know, my own ingenuity. I called them up. I'm like, hey, this is what we're doing. How do we get equipment, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I kind of went from there. <clears throat> so after that, I got to, um, after I finished high school, after I graduated, I started a, um, a company my freshman year at the University of Texas called uh, How Wax Promotions and Marketing. That kind of led me into everything else. Here, were, were your parents music personalities? Were they involved in the music industry? No, other, other than being huge music lovers, there was a lot of music around the house. So outside of that, no, not really. You know, they, uh, I always remember there was always music in the house. My dad loved jazz. My mom loved jazz. So jazz and soul were my first two musical idioms because that's what I heard all the time. My grandparents loved music. They had the older jazz. They had the... Um, um, you know, Sarah Vaughn, the Dinah Washingtons, the um, um, Dakota Statons, you know. <clears throat> and then I had three aunts. One, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but three aunts, they were all like four years apart. So I got different levels of me, of R&B, right? So I had Michael, I had the Jackson Five. I had Ohio Players. I had Roy Ayers, you know, on and on and on. So there was always music around. But no one in the family was really a musician, per se, or a singer, per se. Just always a lot of music. And so that's where your love for music began? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, my mom was very, very an eclectic in her taste. So I didn't feel limited to a particular genre. I mean, my mother, for, because of her, I listened to everything from Fela Kuti to The Mighty Sparrow to... Jose Feliciano to, you know, indigenous musics, you know, she, she listens to some of everything. So I, I feel that's what you could do. Listen to everything. And so who was the first artist that got your guns rolling that really kind of triggered you saying, this is my music. This is what, this is the area I'm going to be involved with that you just fell in love with considering all the artists you already mentioned. Well, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I, I really, really love you. Jazz was my favorite. It's a funny thing. I mean, I love jazz so much. I would carry a radio around with me and have it on the jazz station. Detroit had the good fortune of having, to this day, the only 24-hour, seven-day-a-week jazz station called WJZZ. Still legendary to this day. Everybody in the city knows it. People in other, in other states know it. So because of that, I listen to jazz all the time. You know, it would be with me in my transistor radio. It would be under my pillow. <laughs> <I was sleeping. clears> and of course, as other music, it, it, as the music styles emerged, I got into them. I got into New Wave. I got into a little bit of punk. I got into hip hop immediately the minute it hit, and stayed with it. Uh, I got into I got into dance music, uh, you know, like disco, club, heading into house, and definitely techno because I was around with the guys who actually created the genre, still friends with them to this day. Oh, wow. So, so I, I hung out in high school with Derek May, people <clears throat> may know. Um, later on, you know, I ended up meeting Juan Atkins and I managed Juan for a while, but before I managed Juan, well, when I started my company in Texas, <clears throat> freshman year, uh, when Juan started putting out records, I did a promotion for Juan and got his label distribution in the Southwest region, which is where we were. So anyway, so fast forwarding to, uh, Texas. I, 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 after high school, I went back to Texas because I got scholarships to University of Texas that I had deferred for about a year or so. And my freshman year there, I uh, met a friend of mine, was like my brother to this day, and he was Ward White IV. Ward is actually currently Eric Badu's attorney. Oh my God. And, and has represented her for the entirety of her career. Can we just pause um, real quick? You did say, <laughs> okay. you, you said Eric Badu, right? Yeah, I did. I did. 
it's, it's, a, it's another one of my missed opportunities for one of my, it should have been one of my wives, but we'll, we'll, we'll. <laughs> there's a line of cats that wanted that, right? Yes. I, I, you're still are, still are, you know, <laughs> er, Erica has the magic, right? Oh yeah. So, um, so my freshman year UT, we met early on my freshman year and I DJ that almost the minute I got to UT, I DJed a bunch of the parties. Um, later on, I started DJing what they call Soul Night, which is a major black music night twice a month at UT. So while I was there, well, let me let me rewind. I got a little out of sequence. Before I went back to Houston, to Houston I uh, I was in Detroit, <clears throat> and with a friend of mine at the time uh, named Jeff Mills. Jeff is now, if you look at Jeff is up, Jeff is a major international DJ. Uh, he, he and I had an idea of doing the equivalent of what would become the, fre the Fresh Fest. We were both in the hip hop and I said, well, look, we DJ, let's find us some rappers <clears throat> and some break dancers, and put together a show. You know, I was like the R gang, Little Rascal, let's do a show. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we started putting this together. We found some break dancers. We started trying to try and find some guys who could rap. <clears throat> we were going to do a regional tour first, right? I'm trying to remember what we called the show itself, but so he and I were going to DJ. Well, in that time, we're, I mean, we're, uh, one day we're looking for records. We're out record hunting, and we're at a Goodwill in downtown Detroit. And one of the records I picked up was not a hip hop record at all, not a rap record at all. <clears throat> it was a dance record on a label called Megatone. And Megatone was known at the time for, of course, high energy dance music. And their two biggest artists were Sylvester and the Weather Girls, and he also had Billy. They signed Billy Preston, right? Oh, wow. Something about this record, and yeah, you know, I've always been a, um, I don't even say victim. Always been intuitive, right? And tried to follow whenever I, whenever I had the good sense to do it. Um, there was something about this record. I looked at it all the time. I can still see it in my head today. It was like an aqua blue color with the Megatone logo and everything. And something said, like the way I did with the skateboard company, said something said, call them up. And I'm like, why? They don't do rap music at all, right? Nothing to do with hip hop. But I did. So I called them up and I got in a discussion with this woman named Demetra Mavis, little high energy chick from New York who had moved out to the Bay Area and she was working for Megatone doing promotions. And we talked all, she's like, oh, Karen, I love your energy. You saw that? She's like, we need somebody to do local promotions. And I'm like, that sounds intriguing. <laughs> because I'd always, um, <clears throat> my mother had some friends at Motown. So she would get promotional records sometimes. So I said, yeah, play the records. I always used to wonder who picked the singles, right? And how they got out there to the public. So that was always uh, intriguing to me. So I'm like, hmm, I would love to do promotions. I said, well, look. This may be a deal killer. I'm getting ready to go back to Texas to go to, to college. And she's like, oh, that's great. We have a really big following in Texas. I'm like, you do? I'm like, oh, OK. So that was my first foray officially into the music business. When I got to Houston, I became the local promotions person for Megatone. So that allowed me to get out and meet all the DJs in town, meet the guys at the record pools, meet the, um, the retailers and, of course, the radio stations. And I was super fortunate to get the first song I ever promoted, a song called Can't Keep Holding On by Kenny, oh, is it Kenny James, I think his name was? Um, and I got it to number 30 at the biggest station in Houston. Mm -hmm. So that kind of set the ball rolling for myself and promotions. So when I got to UT, I'd already had a taste of like really being on the business side of the music business and really, you know, seeing what goes on. So I was getting a lot of, so the, my, fr my first part of freshman year, the megatone situation ended. Demetri called me up. She's like, hey, I'm sorry. You know, our, our foray in the R&B is over. We're, we're killing that part. And we're just going to be doing the dance thing still. I was disappointed, of course. But I had an idea. And I was like, I get a lot of records that people don't get hold of. And these guys aren't big enough to have offices like a CBS at the time or you know, uh, an Arista, Warner Brothers, whatever. I said, what if we, myself and Ward, did a promotion for them? We'd be like their satellite office. 
So I threw the idea at him. He's like, man, there's no way we can do that. I'm like, there he is. We can do it. Broke is a joke. <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm talking negative money, right? I'm like, we can do this. We can do this. He's like, no, we can't. We can't do this. I'm like, yeah, we can. So, <clears throat> so um, fortunately, uh, Run DMC was coming to Austin, right? Now, but this by this time I'm at UT. It's the uh, it's the end of the freshman year, summer hits, and Run DMC did a side date. We're, we're doing a side date in Austin from their Fresh Fresh tour dates, and their Fresh Fresh is going to be in next day in Houston, which I didn't know at the time, right? So <clears throat> I got when they're going to be at this place called Liberty Lunch, downtown in Austin. It was a hot spot. It was kind of like a funky place that had a retractable roof, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was really wild, really wild. So I called up this guy I know at the time who worked at the label profile, a brother named Manny Bella, shouts to Manny, uh, still in the mix of this day. I called up Manny, I'm like, hey, Manny, uh, you guys are going to be in town. I want to go see them. He's like, well, look, let me, let me get back to you. Uh, I, you know, I'll call you back. Stay by the phone. And at that time, you literally had to stay by the phone. Right, because <laughs> there were no beepers, cell phones, nothing, no, no, no texting, <laughs> right? None of that, none of that. So I tell Ward, and Ward's like, Look, man, you know, that's cool, but I can't take a chance of missing this. So he went ahead down there and bought a ticket. <laughs> I couldn't blame him, you know, I was like, All right, so I get the call, and then he's like, Look, uh, they're in town, they're at the I don't know, Super 8 Motel, some motel in North Austin, the northern part of Austin. He's like, and you know they're they're out, they're there at the hotel. Their role manager's name is Andre Harrell. So you know, look for look for That's Dre it. when you get it. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Andre, One of the same. Andre Harrell. Uptown Records, the whole night. All right, all right. So I get to the venue, connect with Dre. They, you know, I'm backstage watching the whole show. I'm like looking for Ward and the audience, right? And Ward is like, he's he's like. What the hell? I'm like, what are you doing back there? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Run DMC, you know, sidebar, Run DMC did a phenomenal show. I mean, if for anyone who, who never got to see them back in the day, they were incredible performers, right? Like a lot of those guys were then because that's where you started off. Performing in ciphers in the streets, and on stage parties, and they killed it, right? So they um, they did a great show, and like I realized how masterful the DJ Jam Master J was during that show, because the show the the stage was bouncy, right? And so the needle kept skipping. Jay compensated, adjusted, and I saw him literally. He would catch the needle in midair when it bounced and drop it back on the beat. Oh I'm like this, <laughs> this moment is badass, right? Right. So they killed the show. I mean, you know, not, I would say the, almost the height of popularity, but they just really start hitting, right? Like, figure second album. Show was dope. Come off the stage. Uh, war, I mean, get war backstage, you know, they're, while, they're, while they're packing up. <clears throat> and um, the guys are ready to leave. You know how typical impatient New Yorkers, right? Oh, yeah. Yo, we're, we're, we're ready to get out of here, you know? Well, it's like, yo, where's, yo, where's the cunts? Where's the car? Yo, where's the car? Yeah, we done. So, we done. Exactly, exactly. So Dre, he goes, he goes, yo, y'all got a ride? We like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he like, well, let's go. So my boy Ward at the time, you remember, Ward had a K car, <laughs> <laughs> a Ford, a Ford Fairmount, right? Yes. And we officially called the Benzo, right? <laughs> the Mercedes. <laughs> so pictures. We, we all piloted his K-Car, me, Ward, Andre, Run, and DMC, and we've got Jam Master J's turntables in the trunk. That's crazy. Now, imagine, a couple of college students, man, we're, our minds are blown. So we get them to the hotel, drop them off, and Dre's like, so yo, man, thanks a lot. We're going to see you in Houston tomorrow, right? I look at him, he looks at me, we're like, Right? <laughs> <laughs> we had no clue about Houston the next day, <laughs> but they're playing uh, Astroworld, 
which was the, they used to have an amusement park across from the Astrodome. And that's where they're doing the, the, the second leg, like the, the leg of the Fresh Fest tour was there. So that was Fat Boys, um, who was in that show? Run DMC, Fat Boys, Houdini. I think Dougie did that show. The New York City Breakers, it was kind of, you know, it was amazing, for, especially for the time. So as soon as we pull off, you know, Andre and them go in the room, we pull off, Ward's like, I'm in, I'm in. Whatever you're talking about, I'm, yes, we can do this. <laughs> so that was the day our company, Hot Wax Promotions, was born, officially. Oh, dig it. What a great, great story. So Hot Wax Productions. Promotions, How promotions. It didn't be Hot Wax Promotions and Marketing, yeah. Hot Wax product Promotions. Yeah. How did your experience with Hot Wax Promotions uh, how did it parlay itself into your experience in working with Def Jam Records? Well, uh, Def Jam fortunately ended up being one of our early clients, along with Cold Chillin, along with Tommy Boy, along with um, uh, Uptown when they started. Because we because we had created a relationship with Andre, that mm -hmm. that first initial situation. So, so we ended up working Heavy D. We ended up working Al Be Sure. I bet I met. <clears throat> I met Russell and Bill Stephanie at a uh, music conference, right? Um, I think it was, it was either Young Black Programmers Convention or it was BRE, one of the two. And, you know, everybody was, you know, young and hungry and ambitious then. And, you know, Bill Stephanie, if you don't know who Bill Stephanie is, Bill is not only the person who uh, signed Public Enemy to Def Jam, and he was the first VP and president of Def Jam, Brian Russell. He's also, a, a, he was a member of the Bomb Squad. I dig that. He played guitar on the first album. Dig it. So if you remember the song, Sophisticated. Oh yeah. Uh, he played guitar on that. Yeah, that was Bill. Dig it. And Bill was always a low key, but influential figure in the music business. So because of that, because of the relationship, we were doing promotion in an area that A, people didn't really know about, but B, was very lucrative because Texas being as big as it is, there was a lot of radio stations and a lot of consumers. <laughs> and people had been missing out on that exposure and that money. I mean, Houston became, Houston became a huge market, not just for us, but for the hip hop genre in general. Mm -hmm. Just because of the amount of people, they used to start having a bunch of transplants and Houston's still big to this day in hip hop because of that. I, I, I see that not only because of Beyonce. I know Beyonce, <laughs> everyone just thinks of Beyonce in Houston, but there's a number of different artists and even the music scene itself. Right, back, right. The day that it, back in my day, Houston was a big place for, for influential artists as well. I mean, I mean, Rap A Lot Records ended up starting the same year that we started Hot Wax. Oh, dig it. Dig you it. know, so, you know, I knew all the DJs in Houston. That was kind of the hub, the base. Then, you know, I knew all the DJs in Dallas, San Antonio, Colleen, et cetera. So we, we covered we, the South. We, our, our territory was Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. I don't think, you know, I don't think a lot of people <clears throat> really value the history that Texas has played in urban music and urban culture. I don't yeah, know that, yeah. again, I think it gets overshadowed sometimes, some of the contribution that is played and some of the, it was the seed back in the day for inspiring a number of different artists. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know that, that Primo, DJ Premier is from Texas. Dig it. You know, I matter of fact, I met Primo when I was at UT because classmate of mine they grew up together you know he's the, like a younger brother to him and he brought him up to play to dj he was alpha uh at the uh, university of texas and he brought him to play a couple of alpha parties so you know preem was from there uh a whole lot of cats you know dj yeah. screw of course you know who created like a sub genre unto itself you know with stuff being chopped and screwed screws from down the road in smithville down the road from austin actually so there's definitely a lot of talent and a lot and a lot of love for hip hop. We we broke so many art we broke so many artists in Texas because these kids were ravenous, you know. Whether it was heavy, whether it was uh, Boogie Down Productions, UTFO, Mantronics. I mean, they love Mantronics in Texas. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 
And, and, and again, you, uh, like I said, I don't know that it gets some of the recognition uh, mm -hmm. that how, how it contributed to the early phases of hip hop and the movement. And again, right. with ur urban music itself. Now, considering some of the talent you worked with mm -hmm. and, and your background, LL Cool J, Chuck D, Buster Rhymes, uh, some of these cats, who stands out in your mind at the early port, early point of your career that was really instrumental in you proceeding, taking taking this music journey longer? Was there anyone specific that people recognize that really gave you even more? Uh, I don't know if just inspiration is the correct word, but really you you found this music personality and you, they gave you a further appreciation to want to promote music that was. <clears throat> Well, I mean, well, being a music lover, first and foremost, that was always the big, the biggest driver behind everything, right? Secondly, uh, you know, DJing. I loved um, giving music to people, you know, and watching their reaction and response. That's why I like yeah. DJing more than anything. And I was a big dancer too, so I love dancing. So I, I, I hear you out there, b-boying. You out there, b-boying. Oh, that was just that. I mean, I, I, I was always in the music. I was always in the dancing. I hate a black DJ. <laughs> so, so I was actually critical as a DJ, right? Because if you couldn't keep me dancing, I was mad. I was like, you know, I can do this myself, you know? So <clears throat> I think one of the key, the key figures for us initially yeah. is a guy named, and he's no longer with us, recipe, but a guy named Mike Wilkerson. Mike Wilkerson gave us a shot early on. The first record that we promoted that was really significant hip hop wise was called um, Boogie Down Bronx <clears throat> by this cat named Man Parish. I don't know if you remember, but it was a big song in New York called Hip Hop Bebop. And Man I Parish did that song. That was the song that put him on the map. This was like the follow up song. Uh, and it, 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 got us, it got us recognized because so many cats played that song. So they kind of rolled from there. We had a, a mentor uh, by the name Boogaloo Frazier, George Boogaloo Frazier. And George, you know, Boogaloo taught us the ins and outs of the business. He was like a 20 plus year veteran at the time. He kind of took us under his tutelage. And we just learned a lot about the business side of things. It helped us a great deal. You know, it helped us really become entrenched in it. Uh, another one was um, Tom Silverman, Tommy Boy Records, gave us a shot early on with his roster of, of, of music. Uh, my man, George Hina Hosta, who's still out there, well, Tom too, George Hina Hosta, who's IT's manager to this day. George let us, uh, gave us IT's first single, his first solo single, um, You Don't Quit, and the now eponymous classic legendary Six in the Morning. Oh, dig it. So that helped solidify us even more, right? Mm -hmm. After that, we caught on to an artist early on that was little known at the time, and that was Sir Mix-a-Lot. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. So we promoted like Mix's first single on. Uh, he really broke through it. He did Posse on Broadway, and we helped get that across the country because there were some other promoters that we were in touch with in other regions, and we're like, yo, check out this song we got, Posse on Broadway. And they're like, we never heard this before. So that happened, oh, combined, oh, right, 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 exactly. Oh, yeah. Combined oh, with the yeah. video hitting on BET, they, you know, he became he became a known quantity. You know, so it was a, it was a very cool situation. See, seeing what you saw from the beginning, how the music industry was so raw back then and so filled with raw talent. Um, what do you see now that has changed? I do want to get back to some of these past artists because there's a number of them, but in seeing how music has evolved is probably the better way I would put it. I, I, I'll rephrase that. Has the music industry evolved for the better or, or would you say it has evolved for the worst? Uh, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a dual path. You know, mm -hmm. you've got, you've got positive evolution on one side, you've got negative De-evolution the other side. Mm -hmm. the, the evolution. The evolution's evolutionary side is that um, it's, a, it's, it's a much more DIY business. You know, you don't it, have elaborate to, on that. Elaborate on that if you don't mind. I've always been about, you know, um, people having a chance to really be creative. You know, 
to me, it's not man- like it's not mandatory for everybody to go to college. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some people don't. Some people don't thrive in college. Some people need to just go straight to work or into apprenticeship or whatever. Right. Same thing with music. Everybody didn't need to be on a label. There are a lot of people back in the day when labels were heavily controlling the business. I didn't think need to be on a label. I'm like, you should just go do it yourself. You know, you, you'd be much better for it. Your personality fits being independent, et cetera. But everybody wanted to be on a label, at a label. They clamor for that, right? So now you can wake up in the middle of the night, record a song, and put it out into the world the next morning or the next afternoon. You couldn't do that before because you had all these channels to go through. So because of that, I think there's a lot of really talented people who can get some spotlight. There's a lot of great music that in the previous situation may, may have never seen the light of day. Now, the negative side is that <clears throat> a lot of these talented people don't understand marketing. They don't understand promotion. So you still may not find that great song that got recorded. They just know how to get it recorded. That's it. That's the end of the story. Uh, there's a lot of bad music. I think we have trained really horrible music consumers. <laughs> or we've trained people to be horrible music consumers. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've trained them to be segmented, narrow. We've given them bad music, by and large. You know, poorly constructed music, not well-produced music. So why uh, is that? From a, from an audible me. perspective, stuff isn't let's as great. Let let's go in there. Let's go in there for a second, Kier, if you don't mind. So why have they begun to give them bad music? Well, we did that for a long time. We can't. We really can't blame the independent scene for that. We have to blame the labels for that, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we have to blame the labels for that. In fact, we have to. Um, we, we, the business, have to take onus for that because it became a point. It came a point. I'd say mid nineties, mid to late nineties, early two thousands, <clears throat> where we stopped caring about the artists and artistry, and it became about being good or cool or guilty by association to somebody that was talented. There was a lot of copycatism. There was a lot of plagiarism. There was a lot of not pushing the boundaries and finding new and groundbreaking artists. All you did was find a derivative artist. And then you were giving people, you weren't giving them their money's worth. You know, back in the day, you got an album of 10 songs. Somebody tried to give you 10 great songs. You know, the 90s hit, you got, you know, 15 songs, 10 skits, and most of it was garbage. Mm -hmm. The quality control left the building. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. okay, you felt you, you might have been getting more, but you got one good song. And that made consumers mad. And it, it, it pissed off the public. It really did. So when the chance to rip music came about, that's why people rip so much music. And if you notice, they didn't rip new music. They rip classics. That's right. That's right. That's why the industry was so mad because their bread and butter <laughs> was getting taken. People were going out and getting catalog music. They were going to get those great songs from the 70s and the 80s and the 60s and maybe even before that. They're going out and taking classic music. And I think had we treated them better and given them better music throughout, it might not have happened to the degree that it did. So that's the labels. We're saying, so it's the labels and their, their greed, maybe? It was, it was, it was, it was greed. It was a fact. It was lethargy. People were, you know, lazy. They, there were a lot of people to me, unfortunately, who did not love music. You know, um, they liked all the other accolades, all the other attributes, you know, fame, money, travel, notoriety, blah, blah, uh, access. But they didn't really love music. That's you know, it. I think that's key. <clears throat> uh, I, had, I used to have very few quality music conversations with people, <laughs> you know. Um, so that, that's a big thing. And I think I think we started giving people bad core product and there are very few businesses that exist very few industries where you can make poor quality core product and survive you can't make bad tires and live in the tire business you can't make bad computer chips and live in the computer chip business you can make bad music and live in the record business isn't that something 
Isn't that something? And it, and I find that we find very few precious gems <clears throat> of quality quality music nowadays. It's few. It seems as few and far between. And it even leads me to this question: the gap where young people have the thing where they say the old cats are haters. They're hating on us, the newer generation. Do do you hear some of that yourself lately? I mean, let's be honest. There's, I think in the scheme of life, there's always going to be some of that. Yes. You know. Uh, whether it's basketball or, you know, working in office, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you've been doing this for years and now you got to put some snotty nosed 20 year old that just came out of B school or something, you know, it's just, there's going to be some of that always. So but it's kind I, of the nature, just the yeah, nature of the piece. But some of that, mind you, some of that, but honestly speaking, um, I think there's a few factors at play. A lot. There's still a lot of talented, quality artists. Just because they got older, doesn't mean they're less talented. Absolutely. I think a lot of them. Were, I feel like a lot of them were more talented from the from the beginning, and they just they just missed the payday that they maybe should have had chronologically. Yeah. You know, had they come along five years later, ten years, ten years later, they'd have hit the way they really should have hit. So I can see some of that because you're watching people who are way less talented get paid way more. Absolutely. So that's not gonna make you bitter. It's gonna make you bad, you know, because you know you hate un you hate things that are unfair, unjust, and there's a lot of that. Uh, I'm not gonna say there are no talented young cats out there. There are. I think a lot of the most talented ones you don't hear a lot of. There's some of them independent. There's a kid named La Russell out of the Bay. I love him. You got the uh, people who got caught on to him because of his own efforts. Toby and Wigway out of Houston. Um. You know, there's a, there's a number of them out there. You got you got Boldy James out of Detroit. Uh, some of them are starting to get their notoriety and just desserts. Other ones are still, you know, toiling in the underground, but they're very talented. But yeah, you got a lot of overground talent that's yeah, you know, they're not giving you quality. They're, I'm you know, so they're, glad. <laughs> they give you half-ass music. They give you trite lyrics, if not just damn near disgusting. Like, what are you talking about? Absolutely. Who do this? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, I find, I find that very, uh, yeah, I find I find that conversation is seems is coming more to the forefront where there are real music lovers who are asking the question, where can I find this other talent? So I'm so glad you mentioned those who are not really always known. <clears throat> Are now starting to get their dues. Right, when right. I was in the nightclub business myself, part of what I always uh, felt was important was to shine a spotlight on talent that wasn't yet discovered or didn't have a great deal of promotion behind it. Because I feel the market has become so repetitive and some of the saturated sounds is is it's harder for newer artists to get a break to bring mm -hmm. in a newer form of music. And so I'm glad Bodie James I'm familiar with and I'm glad okay. you mentioned some underground cats. Uh, because I think that the diversity of music is there and it's available, but it's what we've consumed in mass production. I think people, it, underground artists are left sometimes to their own devices on the Instagrams and on the TikTok or cats right, like right. yourself in the early beginning stages. And I, I find that conversation has been coming up more <clears throat> lately. Would you find, you find that yourself? Yeah. Well, once again, back to your thing about, uh, about, advantages and disadvantages an advantage is having social media having these other ways these other avenues of exposure i mean god me i talked to friends of mine like do you know we could have done back in the day if we had these tools oh my god if i was if i had some of these tools and i was doing promotions <laughs> i mean you know we're up every day we're making phone calls you know if I could have pressed a button, sent out a thousand emails at one time, man, please. It's <laughs> you know we're sitting out, we're sitting out handwritten letters. We're running to the post office all day. You know we're at Kinkos, <laughs> we're at Staples. <laughs> it's it's a different ball game, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I find that very interesting. Now, in in talk, going back to Public Enemy, mm -hmm. uh, in working with Public Enemy, what if you had to give us a story? that you you think people should know that they might not know about public enemy what would that, <laughs> like, that you can should share? know let's see if it's something they, they, they might not know 
I don't know if they should do it because I'm sure you check, check your plane like you dog. No, no. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a story that was a, a, combina- a combination story. <clears throat> they had done a uh, they had done the show in Houston and um, decided they had a day off. So I said, look, why don't you come back to Austin and hang out with me, right? So we drove back to Austin from Houston and Chuck was right, literally writing Welcome to the Terra Dome in the car. Oh, wow. Right? So we get to Austin, another piece, side piece. We're in Austin, and we went to the big mall there, right? Let's get the name of it right now. And as we're going to the mall, you know, kids will say, hey, is that it's, it's, me, it's Chuck and Flav, right? You know, Flav is un, oh, yeah. unmissable, right? Yes. So the, the um, a crowd starts to form. And people start flying behind us, right? Next you know there's a crowd behind us. It's looking like the Fight the Power video. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then the police, the police literally kicked us out of the mall. I was so mad. We were so like, why do we have to go? We're here. We've got money. We're shopping. You should be worried about them. <laughs> but they didn't want they didn't want that problem. No. So, oh, no. <laughs> oh no. They they made us leave the mall, man. Can you believe that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was so day. furious. I wrote I wrote them the most blazing letter. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the days, it was it, I think part of their enjoyment was <clears throat> it was so raw and undiscovered the way hip hop was burgeoning in the urban music scene. They didn't know what to make of it, is what I remember as a young man. They didn't yeah, know what to yeah. make of it. And Public Enemy was demonstrative of that raw talent. Right. Plus, so, there, there's, there's another example to talk about. You know, when it came to quality yes, product, good, I good, mean, good. they they the sound they became the soundtrack for movements. Yes, they gave you great music. They still do. You know, oh, yes, quick ca- shout, quick happy birthday, to Chuck, whose birthday was about three days ago. Oh, dig it! Happy birthday, Chuck D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And dig it. Speaking of Chuck D, in somewhat a different vein, you actually worked to help promote the music videos for Boys in the Hood. What? <laughs> what? It was a good album. Here's the sad part about it: we couldn't. We we wanted to do more with the album, but unfortunately, so many. You know, it, it's always got poli- things got political, and the other labels, the other labels that the other artists were on. Didn't really want to give permission for single releases, so mm. <laughs> it was oh, so just that's the album. What, yeah. That's what made it kind of stall or not go as far as it could have gone. Well, it still did well because of the popular movie and the people just bought sure. the whole soundtrack. But it was it was hard. we we only were able to do like two singles to promote the album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was yeah. that was a that was a hindrance. Was John Singleton just for the record? Was he involved in some of the promotion of the music or getting it out there? Um, I guess in a de facto sense, you know, just overall promotion of the film. Um, I don't remember him doing anything specific for the soundtrack for us, but but it, you know, it was a phenomenal project regardless, and and now historical. Uh, yeah, absolutely historical. It's when you know that it, Boys in the Hood is the soundtrack to a number of my contemporaries and colleagues' our lives, and I don't. I I don't. I think people miss sometimes. You didn't necessarily have to be a boy from the hood to understand the hood. It was the experience that we as a people of color could relate to, and that time frame. I think that's what brought it to fruition for a number of people seeing that experience on screen. We could relate. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, you know, it was it was it was a slice of urban life. Absolutely. No matter where you were, you know, you might it might not have been as specific as L.A. You might not have had Crips and Bloods, but it was still urban life, and you yeah. recognize that. And we got very little of that on screen. Period. Mm-hmm. So people connected to it on a number of different a number of different ways and on a number of different levels. Yes. And, 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 and yes, it's actually a better way to put it. I, I appreciate it. that's a better way to elaborate on it. Now, it, with uh, with your history in promotion and in music, give us a little bit about your philanthropy because I've also seen your community and nonprofit work. You have some extensive bit. Tell us about your appreciation for that. Um, I guess 
part of it, I'm, I'm an Aquarian, right? So <laughs> oh. <laughs> our, 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 our whole thing is humanity, right? Yes. <laughs> so I've, always, I've always had a bit of that with me. Um, I think the, the, the draw for that got heightened after 9-11 happened. <clears throat> I had a friend that was in, I had three friends in the entire World Trade Center, but I had one friend who was literally in the first floor that got hit. Oh, wow. Right? Uh, a friend of mine who worked at Marsh, Marsh McClellan. And, you know, they pretty much, they lost everybody. Um, so that was just really like, and when I, when I saw what happened with the music business called themselves putting together after that tragedy happened, yeah, I was, I was pissed and disappointed. I'm like, this is the best we can do yeah. because to, for me and to me, inf- music has always been hugely influential to people on a personal level. Yes. You know, it's soothing, it's healing, it, it's, it's convenient. People come together behind music. Uh, you know, music gets you through tragedy. And we did none of that. I think we had two little whack ass concerts behind 9 11. That was it. I'm like, this is some bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so combine that with how much lame music was coming out. I was like, I'm done with this. I want to do something else. And whatever I do next, <clears throat> I wanted to have some level of philanthropy to it, some some you know upside, some philanthropical upside. So the the first thing I did after that period, I, I worked on a um, a fundraiser for Dress for Success, mm. which I think is a great cause. Yes, for you sure. know they give they give people clothing so they can yes. go do job interviews and get back to work and so forth. Uh, prior to that, you know, years before. I had done work with the for a couple of years with the Special Olympics for their special smiles program where it was a group of dentists that worked with these kids that worked, uh, gave, you know, gave them dental services for the Special yeah. Olympians. And that, that, excuse me, that was very cool. I've uh, worked with, you know, several other situations since then. Um, yeah, I, I, if I can tie, even when I, even when I was in Austin and I did the stuff for South by Southwest. I had done something with the Urban League. I'd done something with Planned Parenthood. I always felt if there, if there was some level of, um, you know, civic give back, I tried to have it invo- involved. You know, I've done events since then with like the, the National Heart Association, um, uh, Sickle Cell Foundation, which I have. I am a, I'm a sickler, as they say. So that's, that's, so that's, that's, so that's, close, so that's close to me, you know, it doesn't get yes. me closer. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. And, and I want to continue to do that and up the ante. And by the way, for everybody out there, September is national sickle cell month. You know, go out and support that. Good <clears throat> There's always a number of events going on and, you know, these organizations need help to help people like myself get through the disease or, or deal with the disease. So yeah, so that that's that's what happened. And so those are near and dear to your heart as far as your philanthropic endeavors. Yeah, and that's and that's what kind of led me to be or try to attempt to be more philanthropic. Now I don't want to cut this short because I'm hoping to bring it back, not the interview, but this question. <laughs> okay. But this question, because I there's too much here I want to go over. Because mm-hmm. don't think I don't think I'm forgetting about Anita Baker. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, I, I was tell us a little bit. Uh, this is going to tie in about rhythm alchemy. Um, rhythm alchemy is uh, a boutique consulting situation I I created not long after I left Warner Brothers, right? And it was kind of a vehicle to allow me to. Work not other people were working with me also, but allowed me to do other projects, marketing projects, right? And so that's become a bannerhead under which I've worked for years. Uh, along with, I am currently also the executive director of the organization of Black Designers, which is a uh, nonprofit professional association for designers of various disciplines. So those are, you know, my two hemispheres right now. And and to tell us a little bit about and, the. 
the oh, I was gonna, I was gonna respond to the rhythm alchemy. Oh, yes. It's funny. Oh, it's me. funny hearing. It's funny hearing the term alchemy now because when I when I came up with the name, um, it was for a specific reason. Uh, I've always been into to sciences. <clears throat> if anyone knows, alchemy is the first science, the first known science, man. Yeah. And the first scientist was a person named Hermes Trismegistus, who people name Hermes but think is Greek, but he's not Greek. He was African. Okay. And the, the you know the basic tenet behind um, alchemy was to turn these base metals, base elements into gold, right? And that's kind of what we tried to do in the music business, trying to turn raw talent, base things into gold and platinum. So oh, to me, like it I yeah, think and all, yeah, right, right. I and you know, that. rhythm, music, and also yeah. you know, there's a there's a rhythm to life. I dig that. So that's how the name came about. Um, so, oh, go ahead. At, at the time, you know, you know how eras change. At the time, I guess it's a little bit ahead of itself because people are like, what is alchemy? What's that? What does that mean? <laughs> and as the years have gone on, you've heard like the group acoustic alchemy. Now I hear alchemy this, alchemy that. Everybody's kind of be on more, you know, oh, I have a vibe. So and so is a vibe. I'm a vibe. Before, all those things were esoteric, too esoteric for the average person. Now it's, it's, it's more it's acceptable. A artist. As a hip hop right. artist, alchemist also, too. Uh, there's a producer named The Alchemist. Oh, dig it. Yep. Now, but in the 90s, no, in the 90s, I, as a DJ, I go into the rhythm alchemist in half a year. Oh, dig it. Oh, dig it. Yeah, yeah. So it's always been a thing for me. It's, been, it's become a thing for other people now, but. Uh, so there you go. There's some, there's some evolution for you. <laughs> and, and so now with the or, with the organization of Black designers mm -hmm. and so forth. So if, tell me a little more about what your goals are with the organization. Well, um, the goal now has been the goal since its inception, 30, 30 plus years ago now, right? Oh wow! Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it, it was created by it is it is probably the first organization of its kind in existence, especially here in the states. <clears throat> It's the brainchild of the chairman. His name is David Rice. David Rice is a noted industrial designer, a graduate of Center for Creative Studies, which is now College of Creative Studies out of Detroit, which is probably one of the top five design schools in the country. Uh, a lot of notables have come out of there. Uh, David conceived the idea of the organization while he was in Detroit, attending CCS, and finally executed it and brought it to fruition when he moved to DC some years later. And it's, it's been a catalyst and a home and a resource for a number of designers, a number of top designers. I mean, we've had, a, we've had some really great people come through our ranks and or come through our conference that you fortunately mentioned, that you so kindly mentioned earlier called Design Nation. Mm -hmm. It reads designation, but it's Design Nation, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which is the first entity of its kind. It was a multidiscipline, multicultural design conference that we had done annually that we're trying to, you know, it's been on hiatus for a while, but we're definitely bringing it back. But we've had people involved in I say either, either and or the organization, uh, like Ruth Carter, who's now an Oscar winning oh, yes. costume designer, Black Panther, Black Panther. Yes. Um, brother Earl Lucas, who is a lead designer at Ford and Lincoln Mercury, Dre Clemens, who's a top tier designer who uh, designed the Arizona iced tea bottle. He designed the real lemon juice bottle. He's designed furniture, the gamut of, of, of design work. Uh, um, I don't think who else we have. You know how we get these questions like, uh, who else? Who else? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Argo Jones, who is a uh, top noted illustrator from Marvel and DC, who created the character Misty Knight in Luke K series. He also oh, worked on the, he also worked on the design elements. He and Art Sims around the Black Panther film. Um, man, just, just a, a ton of people who've been superbly, supremely talented black designers that didn't always get their just desserts. Oh, we have our brother E. Scott Morris. Uh, e. Scott was the lead designer at Nike, went on to design over at Under Armour. He designed the Steph Curry shoe. <clears throat> he is now the chair at uh, Pencil Academy in Detroit, which is a dedicated 
is now the first black AC HBCU in Detroit, but is also a dedicated design school to uh, shoe design. So yeah, it's been a, a number of folks. Well, and this is part of what Makers Bar is hoping to connect with <clears throat> innovators like yourself, because I don't know a number of people, especially myself, having mm -hmm. been in the music, <clears throat> in the arts and music industry for a while myself, that aren't aware of an organization like this. And this is exactly what Makers Bar is hoping to accomplish, is to bring more awareness to organizations like that like this right, right right get them and get them in contact with persons like yourself so i i'm so appreciative of being able to share this opportunity for people to hear especially black designers because right right i, I don't know how the conversation would go that some people <clears throat> aren't aware the real lemon bottle that everyone uses exactly like take for granted yeah to take for granted and those it's exactly you you are ex <clears throat> exemplify with your organization, the type of notoriety we want to hold, right, right, we hope right. to bring to the masses. So that's right. one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by that. And what I'd like to do, uh, just so you know, also, I'd like to have a two-part series for this interview because there's still, we've only touched the surface. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I remiss a couple of people that we have, uh, we have Glenda Johnson, who is a noted, who also does work with, with Dre Clemens, I mentioned, from the, uh, the bottles. Uh, yes incredible scarf designer, accessory designer. She does these phenomenal hand painting silk scarves along the lines of Hermes, right? Oh, wow. Uh, Delinda Johnson, um, Dr. Noel Mayo, who was recently stepped down as chairman of the design department at Ohio State University, uh, veteran designer, a number of patents uh, in lighting and industrial design, phenomenal figure who definitely needs to be more widely recognized than he is. So yeah, we, we've got, you know, our website is obd, www.obd.org. I'm so glad you did Please that. come there, sign Thank up. You. If you've got questions, you can reach us. We're on, we're also on Facebook and Instagram, but you can definitely go to the and website, LinkedIn. contact us. Yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, them. LinkedIn, yes, we have a group <laughs> on LinkedIn. You can contact me on LinkedIn. We love yeah. LinkedIn. Been oh, been yeah. involved with LinkedIn for a very long time, actually. Oh yeah, same here, same here. And what I'd like to be able to do is, as we're going into <coughs> the, oh, the uh, black designers, is uh, see where we can address some of the other questions with that. And I'd like to, with your permission and your uh, time permissive, mm -hmm. to go into part two a little more into um, some of your. You were primary in bringing urban mm -hmm. music to the south by southwest south right, by southwest right. festival and a mm -hmm. number of areas so i'd like to be able to discuss that in a part two right after this if you're okay with that i'm fine with okay that with fantastic so um yes so the black designers i you know i've long since my dad was uh he was an old school cat who in and we know in the part in our history that the story that says I had to walk 15 miles to school. And <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's so funny? It was funny. We, I, we or I've been. I got into the place where we don't have the same story, but we still have it. Like y'all out of school. You know, y'all out of school again. Man, we had to walk through the snow. Snow days. We talking about snow days. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, right here. It's so funny. Where did you get a snow day from? We had to go to school in the snow. It was up to our waist. You know. <laughs> right. Oh, you make me laugh. It's so funny because when I came out here to California and uh, uh -huh. I was talking to the kids, I said, well, I guess you guys don't have snow days. They said, snow days? <laughs> yeah, well, in California, they don't know what a snow day is. <laughs> oh, no. And then yes. being That's a rarity. Here, right. <laughs> you know, a snow day means the apocalypse. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so. We, so we do share some of those similar experiences, and that's what makes it funny that you said that. But uh, oh boy, now <laughs> like, oh my God, it's doomsday! You need snowing. <laughs> right, right, right here, right here, right, here, right. Oh, in California, it's rain days. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Exactly. But, but uh, I was saying, you know, um, for Black History, when my dad would mm -hmm. tell me those stories about walking to school and having oatmeal for breakfast and oatmeal for lunch uh he always reinforced for me 
uh, during Black History Month. Now we can take Black History Month and make different ideological conversations about it, but in us utilizing it as an informative and educative tool, what I've always hoped to do is shed light on those lesser known people who are not celebrated during Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And your organization fits into that brand where I feel how many people know, going back to the real lemon bottle, that those are black designers and recognizing right. the uh, the unknown or unspoken talents that lie within our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've been one who has questioned, why is it, why is it uh, so that there are a number of instrumental and innovators like yourself who have wanted to bring attention to persons of color who have been a big part of the right, uh, movement right. forward and designing it. So that's why I love organizations like yourself that will shed light on mm -hmm. people like that during Black History Month and not just during Black History Month, pardon me, but just in general that all of these things that we take for granted sometimes and they are great creations that were done by people you wouldn't normally consider to have been designers and having an organization for black designers in particular is so fascinating to me and i i think it benefits all of us to know for young people coming up who are interested in designing in whatever the various forms would be and so i'm just so appreciative to shed light on that particular organization your organization itself definitely definitely i mean like you mentioned things that we don't know you got a person like sheila bridges Who's designing great textiles, right? She's a interior designer, but she's doing textiles and fabrics. You've got a Robin Wilson who's doing home decor and housewares, cabinetry, you know, millions of dollars in cabinetry. You've got who I mentioned earlier, Earl Lucas, who redesigned the Fort Taurus. I think he's he's done the current Lincoln current Lincoln Navigator, the the automobiles. Yes, the yes. Tourists. Right. You have you have a Ralph Gill. Who held Ralph Gilles over at um, Chrysler, who designed the Chrysler 300 that everybody loves? You know, like the, the American Bentley. <laughs> he, he designed the Dodge Viper. You know, just got really, really extremely talented people out there. And these are people of color. That is what is so substantial. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Exactly. And, and I. I'm just, I feel so honored that in speaking with you that we can shed light on your organization and those people because I think yeah, yeah. it must be, it must be told the stories that are not often told are some of the greatest stories left in the close, in the pages of the notebook. And I, I, I feel that's one of the areas we can do better on as far as shedding right. lights on those. And that's one of the areas Makers Bar hopes to do. So I, I just feel so appreciative of that. Also, I mentioned uh, I mentioned Erme, I mentioned early Hermes earlier in regards to yes. Glenna and her scarves. There's another brother who actually designed recently for Hermes named Andy <clears throat> Archibong, I and I Archibong, uh, designed a watch for Hermes. Really talented young industrial designer. Everybody I've mentioned, you can find on LinkedIn. That's right. They're oh, all good, good right know. there. So yeah, good to know. I'm really glad you said that. At that at this ju juncture, we're going to close this off as part one, and we're going to restart again. What I okay. like our view our viewers to do, this is just one part of this fascinating man. I, I I just can't say enough about. I have pages of notes here to get into so many of the other facets of this. So I'd like to conclude this part by saying part one. Please join us as we end this portion of the broadcast. Come on, but come on back. We, come on, back. we will be coming right back. Uh, <laughs> Kira and I are going to come right back on to record the second half. Thank you so much for joining us on the first part, Makers Bar, part one with Kira Worthy, as we are going to continue and end here in part one about this portion of his professional career. Part two will be more uh, indulging into some other, other depths of his, his innovations and uh, his history as far as in the music business and this awesome gentleman that is standing before us. One love, people. Part one. One love. Cure Worthy will be right back with you. Part two coming up. Thank you.